So we are going to get started with familial hypercholesterolemia with Dr. Brown. I'm gonna first read uh, Dr. Brown's bio and then um, pass the ball over to Dr. Brown. So Dr. Brown is the immediate past president of the National Lipid Association and clinical associate professor of medicine at the Loyola Stritch School of Medicine in Maywood, Illinois. He is currently the director of the Division of Cardiology at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois, as well as the co-director of the Cardiology Service Line for Advocate Healthcare. Dr. Brown is board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, echocardiography, and clinical lipidology, and has been the director of the lipid clinic for over 30 years. He has published multiple articles, primarily on lipid management in peer-reviewed journals. He is a fellow at the American College of Cardiology, as well as past chair of the Board of Governors for the ACC. He is also a fellow of the National Lipid Association, American Heart Association, and American Society of Preventative Cardiology. Dr. Brown, we are thrilled to have you here today. Thank you very much. I wish my mother was here for the introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. So uh, thank you all for joining. I'm thrilled to see how many people are on the call uh, today. And I know that uh, we have a wide variety of expertise in the audience, including a lot of genetic counsel. So what I was hoping to do for the 45 minutes or so that I have to present is give you, uh, number one, the most common autosomal dominant inherited lipid disorder, and really one of the most common autosomal dominant inherited disorders, period, familial hypercholesterolemia, and give you a clinical viewpoint as well as some uh, metabolic background. And uh, this is a personal thing to me just because uh, one in 250 people have this disorder, and yet 90% of the time it's not diagnosed, and there's dramatic risk for cardiovascular disease in patients who carry this uh, disorder. So I, I'm thrilled to be able to help raise awareness amongst all of you. And for those of you who are aware of the disorder and familiar with it, I hope that I can maybe give you some insights. And then the second disorder I'm going to discuss is a more rare disorder, but one that, uh, you know, and if you run a lipid clinic, you're going to have several patients, which is familial chylomicronemia. We'll talk about the genetic uh, anomalies that can lead to that disorder. That's an autosomal recessive disorder, and uh, the incidence is much lower. So let's dive in. Let me preface this by saying that I'm doing this presentation from home uh, today. Uh, I have a very stable internet connection here. Uh, the only thing that's unstable is my dog, who might start making noise if another dog is barking outside. So I'm just going to tell you that ahead of time and. Uh, That'll settle down quickly if, uh, if she does feel the need to start barking. So let's start with familial hypercholesterolemia. I'm gonna go fairly quickly because I'd love to save some time for questions at the end and there's a lot of material to present. So these are my disclosures. Over the years, I've uh, done advisory work for almost every company that's had a product within lipids. Um, because of my uh, interest in dyslipidemia and also I've participated on several speakers bureaus. Uh, nothing that I'm going to discuss today should uh, have a significant conflict and if it does I will point it out. Okay, so before you all uh, jump out the window, uh, let me say that I'm going to give you a quick overview of lipid metabolism in about 20 seconds. This is important because uh, once you understand the steps in, uh, in uh, lipid metabolism, then it's easier for you to uh, understand how we can get screwed, basically. What, what uh, steps can be disrupted by genetic mutations that can lead to disease? So let me start by saying that there are two ways that we get fats into the bloodstream. The exogenous pathway on the left here, which is from without the body, in other words, uh, from diet. And the endogenous, what your body produces from within, which is uh, primarily uh, uh, regulated by 
the liver's production of lipid particles. Just keep in the back of your mind that fat doesn't mix with water, right? It's like mixing oil and water. So the reason we make lipid particles is because they have unique characteristics in that the outer surface of a lipid particle uh, is polar. In other words, it's water soluble, but the central core is fat soluble. It's really interesting. These are like spaceships that carry cholesterol and triglycerides in the bloodstream. So a lipid particle has an outer pita pocket, as I call it, made of phospholipids that are polar on the outside and nonpolar on the inside, so fat soluble on the inside. Um, and then what's inside is varying amounts of cholesterol and triglycerides. And uh, you can basically identify which particles uh, you're dealing with in a, in a genetic disorder by looking at the ratio of cholesterol to triglycerides in the patient's lipid profile. So that's sometimes very helpful to identify what disorder they might have. So with that said, when we eat a Whopper on the left side of this uh, diagram, the dietary fat goes into the intestine. As you know, then that the uh, triglycerides are broken down by pancreatic lipase into a monoglyceride, which is glycerol with one fatty acid and two free fatty acids. The cholesterol is absorbed through a particular receptor in the intestine called the NPC101 receptor. And the triglycerides are absorbed via the effect of the pancreatic lipase and effect of bile acids. Once they get into the intestinal mucosal cell, they're packaged into the first lipid particle from the diet, which is a large particle that has about 10 triglycerides to every cholesterol. That could be important to remember. 10 to one triglyceride to cholesterol ratio. And uh, they are given the tattoo of the intestine, which is ApoB48 protein on the surface, and uh, given ApoE and ApoC2 proteins on the surface of the particle. So in this diagram, you can see the chylomicron is what the intestine secretes. That's a phospholipid outer shell with 10 triglycerides to every cholesterol inside, and the apoproteins of B48E and C2 on the surface. Uh, that could be terribly boring. Who cares, right? But then what happens is, and the reason these are called chylomicrons is because they're secreted into the lymphatic system or the chylus system, and they go through the thoracic duct and into the, into the bloodstream. Why do we even make these particles? Well, the triglycerides are used for energy production. So remember I said there's 10 triglycerides for every cholesterol, so chylomicrons are very high in energy. When they go through the small capillaries in the muscles, there are little enzymes in the surface of the endothelium in the capillaries called lipoprotein lipase, which removes those triglycerides from the particle and breaks them down into free fatty acids to be used for energy by the muscles. What's left is a chylomicron remnant that has much less triglyceride in it, but basically nothing has happened to that cholesterol. And then the cholesterol, the, the remnant is picked up by a receptor which is very close to the LDL receptor on the liver. So that's how dietary fat is handled. It go, it's packaged into chylomicrons in the intestine, travels through the circulation where triglycerides are removed to form a smaller remnant, and those remnants are then cleared by the liver. The endogenous metabolism, what the liver produces is partially genetically determined, and it can be adjusted by long-term changes in habits, diet, obesity, development of diabetes, et cetera. Uh, but in general, the major uh, fasting lipid profile effect uh, has a lot to do with genetics. And how does endogenous work? It's very similar to the exogenous pathway. The liver makes a particle that's very similar to a chylomicron called VLDL. The VLDL is five triglycerides to every cholesterol. You can see it has ApoC2, ApoE, and ApoB100 on it. B100 is made in the liver and B48 is made in the intestine. So those are the tattoos of where these particles were born. So chylomicron has B48, VLDL has B100. We didn't say much about the ApoC2, but that actually is what turns on lipoprotein lipase. So when the particle goes into the capillaries, the C2 is required to activate lipoprotein lipase to have the triglycerides removed. Same thing happens with VLDL as chylomicrons. It goes through the circulation, gets broken down, the triglycerides are removed to form a remnant, which is called intermediate density lipoprotein or a VLDL remnant. And then as you can see, as all the triglycerides are removed, you're left with the waste product 
of endogenous metabolism, which is a particle that has only cholesterol left in it, which is LDL. Since there are no more triglycerides, you don't need the ApoC2 anymore. It just has ApoB100. And as many of you know, the ApoB100 is the key that fits into the lack of the LDL receptor. So the B100 is what binds that LDL particle to the LDL receptor on the liver for removal from the circulation. Now, one thing that happens in endogenous metabolism that we didn't discuss is those intermediate density lipoproteins, IDL, or also the same particle is called a VLDL remnant. Those can go directly back to the liver without removal of triglycerides in the circulation. That's called the shunt pathway. And when they go back to the liver that way, they bind by the ApoE on the surface. And there's a, there's a lipase on the surface of the liver called hepatic triglyceride lipase that works similar to the lipoprotein lipase out in the capillaries. It, it breaks down the triglycerides into free fatty acids, makes that particle into an LDL where it can either be absorbed into the liver or released back into the circulation. So that's lipid metabolism 101, and it'll help uh, us in determining um, what happens to these particles with genetic disorders. My slide is not advancing, so I'm going to ask um, Stephanie to advance that slide for me if she could. Okay. So I'm not sure what happened here. My, I have a blank slide. I'm assuming maybe you guys do too. Uh, there we go. Okay. I want to show you this animation of the LDL receptor and what happens with LDL. So the LDL particle uh, comes down and binds to via the ApoB on the surface to the LDL receptor, and then that is taken into the liver in, in what's called a clathrin-coated vesicle. Now, in the normal situation, the particle and the receptor, the LDL and the receptor, go into what's called an endosome that has a little bit of acid in it. And then the LDL receptor is sent back to the surface where it uh, gets to live again and pick up more LDL. Now, what happens to the LDL when the receptor goes back to the surface? Well, once the receptor leaves the LDL particle, the LDL is then transferred over to what's called the lysosome. And in the lysosome, you have lytic acid that breaks down the LDL into cholesterol, which is used by the liver to make bile and to make new VLDL particles. We now know that we have a regulatory protein called PCSK9, which is also made in the liver. We're not sure why we secrete it or what the triggers are for it, but when PCSK9 is secreted by the liver, it folds to become its active form. And then once it's folded, it can bind to the LDL receptor. It binds to the receptor in a different location than where the LDL binds. So it comes along and binds to the receptor, and then the LDL particle comes down and binds in a normal fashion to the LDL receptor. So what's the difference? It all gets taken into the liver again, uh, but now the LDL receptor can't go back to the surface. So when the PCSK9 is present, it's like a superglue and transfers the receptor with the LDL to the lysosome, and the receptor gets destroyed. So with uh, high levels of PCSK9, which one would assume maybe the body would secrete to, to try to maintain cholesterol levels, which in the modern human is not critical. So this might be left over from previous, uh, previous evolution. <clears throat> but when PCSK9 is present, it blocks the recycling of LDL receptors and destroys them. So you can't clear LDL from the blood and the LDL goes up. And we've discovered, as you well know, that a mutation uh, that causes a gain of function in PCSK9 leads, leads to very high LDL. Let's go on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we're just going to very briefly review then on familial hypercholesterolemia, what clinical syndromes look like FH. So by far and away, 90% plus of people that have familial hypercholesterolemia, which manifests as very high LDL, have a mutation in the gene for the LDL receptor. And it's an autosomal dominant trait. So heterozygous FH patients will have one normal uh, LDL receptor gene and one abnormal. We know there's about 1,600 mutations that can cause a ma malfunctioning LDL receptor. And when that happens, you double your LDL levels. So if normal LDL level in the blood is uh, 85, 90, these patients tend to have 190 or greater LDL as adults. Very rarely, uh, oh, by the way, that happens in one in 250 adults. So it's extremely common. If you go to a restaurant, you're gonna see it. Uh, rarely, you will find uh, homozygous where two heterozygotes uh, get married and have a child. There'd be a one in four chance of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia causing a homozygous patient. Uh, that would be one in a million people. Those people have no functioning LDL receptors, have cholesterol that's well over 1,000, and heart disease usually at 10 to 12 years old. Uh, and the other, op the other possibility is a mutation in ApoB that causes the LDL not to be able to bind to the receptor. So when that happens, you get also very high LDLs. Um, that's a much more rare cause of FH, but as you know, when we do genetic testing, we look for ApoB mutations. And then more recently, we discovered this mutation in the gene for PCSK9 that overproduces or increases the function of PCSK9, causing destruction of LDL receptors. That's also a dominant trait, and uh, it's extremely rare, but it can look exactly like familial hypercholesterolemia clinically. And then even more rare, and this is something that all, all genetic testing companies provide you with for reasons that may not be totally clear because it's extremely rare, is autosomal recessive hypercholesterolemia, which is a mutation in the anchoring protein that holds the receptor in place. And if that mutation occurs, and again, it's a recessive trait, you get a cockeyed receptor, and that cockeyed receptor doesn't capture LDL well. Those patients look more like homozygous FH with extremely high cholesterols, and uh, they're very difficult to treat. They're very refractory to treatment, whereas heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia usually responds fairly well to treatment, but requires very potent drugs. Next slide, please. So we mentioned about one in 250 people have heterozygous FH, so if you go to a restaurant, you're gonna see one. Uh, it is usually associated with total cholesterols in the 300 plus range and LDLs over 190. Um, as you can see, 620,000 patients in the US and 90% are not diagnosed because shockingly many physicians are unfamiliar with this disorder. And there are founder effects in certain populations like French Canadians, Dutch Afrikaners and Lebanese uh, that have much more common occurrence because they tend to cluster together. Uh, as a population. So the gene is very common in that population. Next slide. Homozygous FH, about one in a million cholesterols, usually around a thousand, very difficult to treat. Uh, they can be compound heterozygotes or uh, homozygous mutations, uh, but they tend to have uh, minimal functioning of their LDL receptors. And again, as I mentioned, heart disease as a child, those people should all go to a lipid clinic because the primary therapy is LDL apheresis, which is like dialysis to remove their LDL. Next slide. I think we've discussed this. Uh, next slide. Uh, if anyone's interested in where the LDL receptor gene resides, it's on the short arm, arm of chromosome 19 as listed. Um, and I mentioned, this is an older slide, that there are upwards of 1,600 mutations that have led to the clinical picture of familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. Just a little bit about the risk, by the way. So if you have the mutation, if you have a positive genetic test, you have 22 times the risk for a major cardiovascular event. Uh, 
If you have an LDL over 190 without a genetic mutation, the risk is much less. It's uh, somewhere around six times, still very high risk due to the high LDL. The difference is probably due to the fact that if you have a genetic mutation, you've had the high cholesterol since the day you were born. Whereas people who have very high LDLs later in life who don't carry the mutation probably had lower LDLs in, the, in their youth. So they haven't had that long-term high cholesterol in their body. But obviously, both patients have very high risk. But the importance of genetic testing here is identifying an extremely high risk group with 22 times the risk. Um, and I think we've talked about all four of these, so we can go on. Physical findings, many patients have none, especially if they were started on statins early. But tendons and thomas are sort of pathognomonic. I'll show you a couple of pictures where they get them on the extensor surfaces of their hands, and particularly on the Achilles tendons, which requires uh, actually uh, feeling the tendons. I'm going to show you some great pictures, but in the clinical setting, you really have to feel for the, tending, the, the tendons. Xanthelasma, corneal arcus, these are things where you get a little white ring around the eye, around the uh, cornea. Those are not specific for FH, but if you see them in young individuals, you, you definitely have to think about it. Patients can get aortic stenosis with FH, particularly if they have LP little a also elevated. Um, that markedly increases the risk of aortic stenosis. And those two mutations tend to uh, frequently travel together. And then peripheral arterial disease, giving you breweries in the peripheral arteries. Next slide. Screening is recommended for all children who have parents with high cholesterol or with known FH. And two to five years old is usually when we screen the children. We start treating the children with statins at seven to eight years old. In a child, an LDL over 160 should make you concerned that the patient may have FH. And here's very pertinent to genetic testing. Occasionally, a patient who inherits a mutation in the gene for their LDL receptor will have some other mutation that actually lowers their LDL. So you might see the child of a person with FH with an LDL of 130, keeping in mind that a normal total cholesterol for a kid is about 140. So an LDL of 130 is still quite high in a child. And uh, though it doesn't reach that threshold of 160 to make you think about the diagnosis in the child, that, that child might have another mutation that actually lowers the LDL, but they could still pass the FH on to their children and their children may not be lucky enough to have an, an additional mutation or SNP that might affect, uh, effectively lower their LDL. So when we see 130 or higher in children, we do a genetic test to see if they carry the mutation for FH. Next slide. So certainly everyone on the planet should have their lipids screened when they're 18. Uh, and everyone with high cholesterol or a family history of premature uh, heart disease should get their cholesterol screened as a young child. Next slide. Cascade screening is done of the family. So if you identify a patient, you obviously it's critical to look at all their brothers, sisters, their parents and their children. So first order relatives are all screened. And, and we tend to do genetic testing on all of them. So if they have LDLs of 190, 200, and we know the mutation in their first order relative, it's highly likely they have a similar mutation. Next slide. And in the old days, we did not do genetic testing because it was so expensive, but now we have the luxury of doing it. And in many cases, we can do a first order relative for free if we have identified a mutation in the patients. I'm just gonna, uh, finish here with treatment considerations. We have lots of data with safety of statins in children who are eight years old and older. Um, generally, most people are using statins now at seven or eight. Uh, if they have homozygous FH, they're given statins early, but often end up on apheresis or are using a couple of drugs which are specifically uh, for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. They reduce the production of VLDL. Uh, the problem with that is they don't release fat from the liver when you don't make VLDL, so they do get some fatty liver. Seems to be relatively safe over the long term, but because of safety concerns of fatty liver in those patients, uh, those drugs are reserved just for homozygous FH and have to be written by a lipidologist who has been certified to use those medications. One comment I'd like to make, since many of you are genetic counselors, it is very important when you're treating young women 
uh, even children and, and certainly as they get into adolescence to let them know that we don't want them on the statin if they get pregnant. So we discuss with them the importance of stopping the statin four to six weeks prior to attempting to conceive and staying off that statin until they're done nursing. And we document in the chart that we had that discussion with them. I will tell an eight-year-old that, and I'll talk with their parents at the same time and make sure I document it. And you know, it's very fun for an adult cardiologist to follow these children. Um, and uh, I, I make sure that we have the discussion about pregnancy and any young women. Let me just add one thing. Why treat so early? We have some data from the Netherlands where they screen everybody for FH because of the high prevalence of disease showing that if you wait till a child is 18 to put them on a statin and they have familial hypercholesterolemia, one in 10 of them or 10% will have a cardiovascular event by age 30. Whereas the children that are treated in the modern era at seven or eight have a 0% incidence of cardiovascular disease by age 30. So it just makes sense that the earlier you treat, the better the benefit, the less exposure, the circulation to very high cholesterol. I tell my patients it's a 401k plan. You're making an investment early and it pays big dividends as they get older. So it's important to reassure parents that little Johnny is gonna be okay being on a statin. Uh, the two biggest barriers are worries of the parents to put a young patient on, a young kid on medication. So a lot of safety data for virtually all the statins. Doesn't affect puberty, doesn't affect bone growth. There doesn't seem to be any safety issue, even at younger ages than seven or eight, though the, the label allows seven or eight. The other barrier sometimes is pediatricians, unfortunately, who are not familiar with the disorder and who tell parents to just focus on a healthy diet, which in 2020 is actually malpractice. So we want to encourage folks to take the medication and reduce the risk of premature heart disease. Next slide. Okay, so this is just the same diagram showing that if you block the LDL receptor, either by a mutation in the gene for LDL receptor or a gain of function mutation in PCSK9 where you destroy LDL receptors, or if you have a mutation in ApoB100, uh, in the gene for ApoB, you can't bind to the receptor, but the net effect is you build up LDL in the blood. So the lipid profile in these patients has a high LDL, a normal to slightly low uh, HDL, and normal triglycerides, uh, and a very high cholesterol due to the high LDL. So they generally don't have triglyceride elevation, though you know there's nothing to say they can't get diabetes or morbid obesity on top of this disorder, in which case, High triglycerides would come along with it, but have nothing to do with the genetic mutation. Next slide. Next slide. I'm going to skip this because I want to make sure that we. Get, uh, this is the autosomal re recessive hypercholesterolemia. You can see the clathrin pit with the little wrenches in it that are the LDL receptor. And that pearl at the base of the LDL receptor is called the LDL wrap protein. It's a mutation in that gene, the anchoring protein called LDL wrap one, uh, which causes autosomal recessive hypercholesterolemia. If you see this in your career, I'd be shocked. But again, these patients look more like homozygous FH, but they would not have a mutation in the LDL receptor. It's a recessive disorder, so very, very rare and very hard to treat, poorly responsive to traditional LDL lowering therapy. Next slide. This is a homozygous FH patient with giant extensor xanthomas. Next slide. That's Achilles tendon xanthomas in a patient with heterozygous FH. Again, they don't always look this thick, but when you feel the, atten the tendons, they're lumpy bumpy. Next slide. Next slide. This is much more common for a tendon xanthoma and a heterozygous FH patient. This is one of my patients. And you can see the lumpy cholesterol deposits on the extensor tendons. Doesn't cause any disease, but it's pretty much pathognomonic if you have a high cholesterol and you have these xanthomas. It's very likely you have familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. Corneal arcus is not uncommon at a young age, so anybody under 45 with this, you should think could have FH and the xanthelasma you see on the right. Neither are specific though. You can see these in other disorders. Uh, some people with xanthelasma have normal cholesterol. Uh, 
but in the face of high cholesterol, this is common with FH. Next slide. These are just uh, gross examples of xanthomas in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. This is a coronary angiogram on the left of a 12-year-old girl showing a left main coronary stenosis with homozygous FH. And on the right, the aorta is narrowed right above the heart due to atherosclerosis in the ascending aorta uh, in a 21-year-old with familial hypercholesterolemia, both with homozygous FH. Next slide. And the treatment we kind of went through, high dose statins, you can add azetamide. We now have the PCSK9 inhibitor drugs that uh, block PCSK9. They basically are antibodies against PCSK9, which allow the LDL receptors to have a longer life expectancy and increase the numbers on the surface of the liver. And that's quite effective in lowering LDL in the heterozygous FH patients. Okay. Let's take take a few minutes. I'm going to blow through this because this is very rare, but uh, it's an interesting case that I had, and one that genetic testing is sort of critical because some of the new therapies under investigation are probably only going to be available to people who have genetically proven chylomicronemia syndrome. So let's go through this quickly. Next slide. So the, the member chylomicrons have 10 triglycerides for every cholesterol. So chylomicronemia is a disorder where you can't break down chylomicrons. So you remember that lipoprotein lipase is the enzyme that breaks down chylomicrons. And remember that APOC2 activates lipoprotein lipase. So we're gonna go back to this in a second. Those are two of the five mutations that can lead to chylomicronemia. You're gonna get serum triglycerides 10 times the cholesterol. So 2000 or greater triglycerides in someone whose cholesterol is 200 because those chylomicron particles have 10 triglycerides to every cholesterol. It is an autosomal recessive trait. So folks in the family are usually carriers, um, but if the patient has either a compound heterozygous abnormality or a homozygous abnormality, they will present with severe hypertriglyceridemia. Mild increase in risk for heart disease, but the biggest risk because of the severe hypertriglyceridemia is pancreatitis. And these patients are often accused of being alcoholics because their triglycerides are high and they don't respond very well to therapy at all. Uh, next slide. So again, if you remember the diagram for exogenous pathway, chylomicrons uh, have 10 triglycerides of cholesterol, the C2 activates the lipoprotein lipase. So two causes could be a mutation in APOC2 or a mutation in lipoprotein lipase. Either way, you can't get lipoprotein lipase to work and the patient will build up chylomicrons. We're gonna talk about a couple other mutations you would see on genetic testing that also can lead to FCS. Next slide. Keep going. Um, I'm gonna skip this uh, other than to say that um, we know that cholesterol comes in through that sterile transport of the MPC1L1. Triglycerides uh, come in through the activity of pancreatic lipase making chylomicrons. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So uh, this is a little bit about lipoprotein lipase. So we met, remember it breaks down triglycerides from uh, lip, triglyceride rich particles like chylomicrons into fatty acids. It's activated by APOC2. It can be inhibited by APOC3, which we see in obese patients, people with diabetic disease, and people with insulin resistance. And then where's lipoprotein lipase made? It's made in the interstitium. I'm sorry, it's made in fat and muscle cells, adipocytes and myocytes, and then secreted into the interstitial space. But it has to get from that interstitial space into the capillary lumen where it can work on the, on the uh, triglyceride-rich particles going by. And that requires what I call the long arm of the space shuttle, GPI-HBP1. It's a protein that grabs the lipoprotein lipase in the interstitial space and swings it into the capillary lumen to be available to break down triglyceride-rich particles. Next slide. I'll show you a quick picture of that. So here you can see the chylomicron in the middle, in the middle of the capillary. The lipoprotein lipase is the red dot. And the GPI-HBP1 protein has grabbed that lipoprotein lipase 
from outside the capillary in the interstitial space and swung it into the lumen for the chylomicron to be acted upon. So what can go wrong genetically? You can have a mutation in the gene for lipoprotein lipase where it's not made properly. You can have a, a mutation in the gene for what's called lipoprotein lipase maturation factor or LMF1 so that the lipase doesn't leave the cell and go out into the interstitium. You can have a mutation in that long arm of the space shuttle, the GPI HBP1, so that protein can't grab the lipoprotein lipase out of the interstitium and move it into the capillary, where, uh, and therefore it can't work on chylomicrons. And then you can have a mutation in APOC2 so that you can't activate the chylomicrons. And the last piece, next slide. Next slide. The last piece is APOA5, which you see here looking like a fork on the HDL. APOA5 holds the APOC2 and the lipoprotein lipase shown here as blue dots, all in the right configuration so that the C2 can activate the lipoprotein lipase. So we have those five mutations that lead to chylomicronemia, an APOA5 mutation, an APOC2 mutation, a lipase maturation factor, LMF1 mutation, a lipoprotein lipase gene mutation, or a mutation in GPI HBP1, the uh, protein that swings lipoprotein lipase into the capillary lumen. Next slide. Here's the most common mutation. So you can see by far and away, lipoprotein lipase mutation is the 95% of what you'll see genetically an LPL mutation. Usually these are compound heterozygotes because it's a recessive disorder. So you're gonna get uh, two different lipoprotein lipase mutations in the patient who manifests with the disease. But you can also see other mutations, uh, APOC2, GPI, HBP1 mutations, APOA5, and LMF1 mutations that we talked about. Uh, and a patient receiving two, any two of these mutations on the separate alleles will develop chylomicronemia. Next slide. Carriers, by the way, might have mild triglyceride elevation, but they don't have this terrible disorder. So the homozygous or compound heterozygous patients, they get triglycerides that can be as high as 10,000, multiple episodes of pancreatitis, lots of abdominal pain, frequently miss work, frequently are accused of being malingerers, and are frustrating to doctors because their triglycerides don't come down. Uh, they've had their gallbladders out and other unnecessary surgery with people trying to figure out why they're having chronic abdominal pain, which is due to their pancreas. And in many cases, are, as I mentioned, are accused of being alcoholic when they don't drink any alcohol. None of the drugs that we traditionally use to lower triglycerides work in these patients, so it's a, it's a real disaster. And the treatment is to reduce chylomicron formation by an extremely low-fat diet. It's a very hard diet to stick to, less than 10% calories from fat. And uh, we have some newer potential treatments that uh, we hope will uh, help these patients, but none of them are yet FDA approved. Next slide. Um, I'm going to uh, skip over this other than to say that APOC3, which I told you inhibited lipoprotein lipase was the target of a therapeutic option for these patients an anti-sense drug that reduces production of APOC3. Now you wouldn't think that would work if the lipoprotein lipase doesn't work. So removing, removing a, a drug that would suppress, I mean, a, a protein that would suppress lipoprotein lipase should increase activity if the lipoprotein lipase works. But if the lipoprotein lipase doesn't work, you wouldn't think it works, but believe it or not, it does. So, uh, an antisense drug against APOC3 has shown to reduce triglycerides up to 80% in these patients. We don't think it has to do with relieving suppression of lipoprotein lipase. It probably has to do with activating uh, receptors in the liver that pick up chylomicrons. Uh, so hepatic lipase uh, gets more active with the reduction in APOC3 also. Next slide. With real high triglycerides, particularly chylomicrons, you see if you spin their serum down and look at the test tube on the right, you see that there's a supernatant of white there. Those are how chylomicrons show up. Whereas in the middle, if the, part, if the serum is turbid throughout, it's primarily VLDL and of course normal is clear on the left. 
Next slide. The physical findings of any cause of hypertriglyceridemia, not just chylomicronemia, are tuberal eruptive xanthomas. This is on somebody's rear end, not mine, I'm pleased to say. They go away when you treat with triglycerides, um, and they can also be on the trunk and the elbows. Next slide. That's on the abdomen, obviously. Next slide. If you biopsy those, they're filled with triglycerides. Next slide. Uh, you can get deposits of fat in the eyes, causing lipemia retinalis with very high triglycerides. Next slide. And so chylomicronemia could be a C2 or a uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency, uh, or it could be due to APOA5, LMF1, or GPI, HPP1 mutations, as we discussed. And those are the five genes you're going to see when you order a panel to evaluate for chylomicronemia. By far and away, lipoprotein lipase mutation is the most common. Next slide. Uh, we have the what I've described to you, the monogenic familial chypo chylomicronemia syndrome, which is patients who have autosomal recessive mutations in their alleles that lead to chylomicronemia. More commonly, you see something called polygenic chylomicronemia, where someone might have a single mutation in one allele. They might be a carrier and, say, have an A5 mutation in one allele. But then you add obesity or you add alcohol or you add diabetes on top of it, and they get the polygenic disorder. It's pretty easy to make the diagnosis because the polygenic ones usually respond quite well to treatment, whereas monogenic chylomicronemia responds to nothing except a very fat-restricted diet. Next slide. Okay, so we kind of went through this. I want to make leave time for questions, and we're getting close to the end here. So just want to tell you about one case. Uh, next slide. And, I, and we talked about the psychosocial burden and loss of work and people accusing them of being malingerers and chronic abdominal pain. Next, next slide. It's a terrible disorder to be stuck with. Um, you can see that I, I, this is a group of 40 some patients that on average their symptoms started at 15 years, although we have some that started at three. And on average, 34 episodes of pancreatitis. So let me tell you about this case and then I'm going to move to the last slide. Uh, I had a 30-year-old female, she was 28 when I met her, who was the, started with her first episode of pancreatitis at three years old. She had 30 episodes of pancreatitis up to age 28. She had been lucky enough to be seen at a university where they made the initial diagnosis, and she swore that she was following the diet. Um, so we met her, we tried to get her into a clinical trial to lower her triglycerides with one of the newer agents, but her pregnancy test came back positive. So you can all imagine how terrible it would be to get pregnant uh, because the triglycerides go up dramatically when you get pregnant. And in fact, in many cases, uh, that it's a fatal disorder either for the baby or the mother if they get pancreatitis during pregnancy. So in her case, what we did was plasma exchanges throughout her pregnancy. We removed her plasma uh, and gave her someone else's plasma, which lowered her triglycerides. We started out once a week, and as the baby grew, we had to do it twice a week. And uh, she uh, had no pancreatitis throughout the pregnancy and actually uh, delivered a healthy baby. So then we sent her back to be enrolled in the clinical trial for treatment. And lo and behold, she had another positive pregnancy test and ended up with twins. And we had to go through the whole process again, doing a plasma exchanges twice a week throughout the pregnancy. What was fascinating is as the twins grew, her triglycerides started to go down. The babies were actually uh, metabolizing her triglycerides and lowered them until she delivered. And she delivered two healthy babies. So she has three young kids. I have a picture of her at the end. You can go to that picture. Um, and her, we had done extensive screening and published her family's uh, results. Uh, she had two different mutations. Uh, and I've listed them, but I'm not going to bore you with it for the sake of time. But there she is with her first baby after uh, and I've had permission to show this picture. She now has three young kids and has done very well. 
but uh, the fatality rate for mothers and babies with chylomicronemia when they get pregnant is extremely high, which is why we had to use that very aggressive therapy. So I'm going to stop here and thank you all for uh, watching this. I know it's a lot of detail and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Brown, so much. This, the information was so um, thorough and interesting, and you have quite a few questions um, already. So I'm just going to get started with um, reading these questions. I'm going to have to make them a little bit bigger so I can see them. Yes, uh, fine. Thank you for reading them for me. <laughs> Uh, so the first question someone had asked about um, um, access to the slides or to um, the talk, and I think we've already answered that for for the the participant. Yeah, but I just you're, you're welcome anyone... to give the slides to anyone who wants them. Uh, there's more material there, including for the genetic geeks like myself, uh, the mutations that we found in the family of uh, the young lady that I discussed with chylomicronemia, but. Yeah, you're more than welcome to circulate those slides. Wonderful. And if any of and you are teachers, uh, please teach people about familial hypercholesterolemia. There's I also a it. lot of good reference material on the NLA website. If you go to lipid.org and you go to documents um, and statements, there's a whole a beautiful, complete discussion for adults and children on familial hypercholesterolemia, um, as well as many other good documents there. Uh, and as far as uh, then that you may know about the FH Foundation, they have a website. It's a patient-driven organization with excellent materials and a registry for FH patients. Again, it's called the FH Foundation. And then uh, the National Lipid Association has a site called learnyourlipids.com, which has information on FH, familial chylomicronemia, and many other rare disorders. And it's spelled just the way it sounds, learnyourlipids.com. Awesome. Uh, we will also have this entire webinar uploaded on our website, so um, you can all refer other folks to the webinar or um, uh, listen to it again. So we have a number of questions, and we will work our way through these, Dr. Brown. Um, but if anybody has questions that we don't get an opportunity to get to, we will be um, answering these via email after. So the first question that I have here is, is there a general review paper that you would recommend or a management guidelines expert consensus statement that you recommend on this topic? Yeah, so on familial hypercholesterolemia, there is a review on lipid.org under statements and consensus documents, which is right on, you don't have to be a member to get to that. It's on the main page, lipid.org. So that's an option. Um, in addition to that, the American Heart Association had a recent review article uh, that um, I think it was about a year and a half ago came out on familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so, uh, that I think came out in circulation. So I don't have the exact reference, but uh, that would be also a, an up-to-date article and really focused a lot on the importance of genetic testing. I think what we've learned over time is that uh, people don't always present with classic uh, numbers. They might have an LDL close to 190 and still carry the mutation as I discussed earlier. So. Now that the cost of genetic testing has come down, uh, we tend to do it with reckless abandon. Uh, the other piece of it is that with some of the newer drugs, uh, particularly the PCSK9 antibodies, which initially were very expensive, their, their price has come down by about 60%, but they were very expensive and very hard to get approval for. If you could show a genetic mutation, in other words, a definite FH based on genetic testing, you could get approval without any difficulty and it, it was almost impossible otherwise. We didn't talk about it, but there are clinical criteria called the Dutch criteria and the World Health Organization criteria uh, for diagnosing FH. And you know, to get those medications approved, you'd have to have eight points on the Dutch scale, which was extremely hard. The patient could have FH and still not have eight points. So uh, one 
way to to get around all that was to do the genetic testing and that allowed you to get those medications for your patients who most needed them. So, so there's been an explosion in genetic testing for FH uh, just because it did help get patients appropriate therapy that were otherwise being denied. Thank you. What is the best way for genetic counselors to assess for the need of testing elevated LDL if the patient has been on statin treatment? Yeah, that's tough because uh, you might not know what their LDL was at baseline, right? If they're already on statin treatment. So I think that the red flags are, do they have a first order relative that has very high LDL since it's a dominant trait? Do they have a history of premature heart disease in the family? And frequently the males will be the ones who, who died at 35 or 40 years old. What's interesting is occasionally it'll come down through the women. It's not sex linked, it's just accidental. But you might have a woman who doesn't smoke, not diabetic, otherwise very healthy, who survives having very high LDL. You know, not everybody gets hit by a car even when they cross with the red light. So uh, that and that female, I almost never see that in males. I'm just quoting my experience here. But you will occasionally see a female who's 85 years old who has a cholesterol of 350 and an LDL of 225 and never had a problem. They can sometimes pass it on to a daughter. And that daughter is also blessed. And then the son gets it, the grandson gets it, and he has a heart attack at age 40. So when you don't see a strong family history, that occasionally is the reason. Even though women statistically have a similar risk to men just 10 years older, um, they definitely uh, you know, get 22 times the risk. You do occasionally see women escape uh, for reasons unclear, and that almost never happens in men. So when you're looking at the family tree, History of premature atherosclerosis is very important. First order relatives with very high cholesterol, very important. And then of course, tendons and thomas make the diagnosis on exam. So here's a million dollar question. Why is there a high percentage of people that are undiagnosed? What are some of the reasons in your opinion? I think there's just a perception among physicians that this is a rare disorder. And, you know, you remember it was 1950s before Watson and Crick even discovered the DNA. Yeah. And uh, th these kind of mutations and genetic disorders really didn't get into broad discussion until many years later. So uh, some docs just never had it in their training. Uh, I have given a talk to 600 doctors at a uh, an internal medicine meeting, and I asked how many of you have seen a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia. Three people raised their hand. And I said, well, that, that's why I made, took the time to come here today, because you've all seen the patients. You just didn't know about it. There's also a perception uh, by physicians that um, you're going to treat it anyway, so why do you need to know the genetic disorder? Um, you, everyone knows if the cholesterol is high, you have to treat it. And I pointed out a really sad story that's a true story that happened to me. I had a 65-year-old woman come in who had seen multiple physicians and had intolerance to statins. She was referred to me because she got muscle aches from statins, but her cholesterol was 330 and her LDL was 250. And I said to her, do you know what you have? She said, yeah, I've got really high cholesterol. I said, no, you probably have familial hypercholesterolemia. Do you have any kids? And she had three children, two daughters in their 30s, and a 28-year-old son who was an Army Ranger. So I told her, you need to test them immediately. Just get a lipid profile. They should be treated when they're a kid. Uh, but definitely, even the 28-year-old, we would put on treatment right away. So her two daughters immediately went and got tested. They were fine. The Army Ranger told her, Mom, you know, I've been tested. I've had three physicals with the Army. They would have told me my cholesterol's high. And he died about a month after that conversation, uh, sudden death uh, at, at a, during an Army Ranger exercise. And it turns out that the military doesn't check cholesterol on kids. So he almost certainly had it. So those stories, I tell that story at the beginning of every one of my lectures on the topic uh, to physicians uh, with the hope that uh, they will understand that, yes, in that individual patient, index patient, you're going to just treat the cholesterol. But if you don't know this is an autosomal dominant disorder, the kids are going to die. And we have a commitment to those children. 
All right, I think that we have time um, for one more question. There are so many more questions coming in and all of your questions will be answered um, by Dr. Brown. Um, you agreed to answer these via email later, but I'm going to- um, I'll do my best. If it takes me three weeks to do it, and then I might have to- <laughs> We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Um, all right, so uh, one last question that we'll, we will get in is if an adult is identified to have an LDLR mutation incidentally, such as on carrier screening, but has consistently normal LDL, what do you recommend for surveillance or treatment? Have there been any studies on these patients for long-term outcomes or risks? No, that's a great question. So it sort of depends. I mean, there are some mutations in LDLR that are not pathogenic, right? The receptor can still work. So you guys know that that could be labeled as a, either a, a, a mutation of unknown significance or a, a pathogenic, or maybe it's not a pathogenic mutation. So that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is they have some other offsetting SNP that lowers their LDL, even though they do have a pathogenic LDL receptor mutation. The data long-term looks like if their LDL is low, that they do have better outcomes. Um, maybe not quite as good as you'd expect with somebody who doesn't carry that mutation, but uh, the outcomes seem to be related to their LDL levels. So there is some improvement. But as, as I mentioned, the big danger is if they have a pathogenic LDL receptor mutation and they're lucky enough not to have a high LDL, they could pass that mutation onto their child in a dominant fashion and the child may not have the other SNP that lower the LDL in that individual. And uh, then it could be, uh, the child could be at very high risk. So we, we take that pretty seriously. There is an article, uh, I cannot remember where it was published, uh, by Amy Sturm, S-T-U-R-M, uh, in the last couple of years. I know that the FH Foundation, you know, promoted that article and probably you could find it on their website that kind of goes into those issues. It's a very in-depth article about FH and genetic mutations. So something that you might want to look up. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much. We are a few minutes over the hour. I'm glad um, that you stuck around and answered a few more questions. And like I said, the other questions we will forward to you. Um, and we really enjoyed having you and appreciated uh, your time. And this topic is a very popular one. A uh, lot of folks with questions about it. I do wanna let everyone out there know that our next Educate Next is um, a part two on telehealth best practices. So if you did tune into our first one or if you didn't, um, we will have more um, discussions about telehealth, and that will be Wednesday, June 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Yeah, thank you. Bye.